Hello, my name is Anna and I love trying vintage recipes. So today I'm trying three Bisquick recipes from the 1980s. Today's recipes come to us from Betty Crocker's Creative Recipes with Bisquick. This book was originally published in 1980 and I'll talk more about it a little bit later. So Bisquick, I think many of my viewers are probably familiar with this product, but I have had a few comments lately from outside of the US from people who don't really know what it is, you know, when I've used it in some other recipes. So Bisquick is a baking mix. And usually, you know, when people think Bisquick, they think pancakes, biscuits, waffles, maybe a shortcake, but there are a lot more things that you can use it for. And that's what you're gonna see in this video. So I'm gonna make some savory dishes, I'm gonna make a dessert, and maybe it'll give you some ideas. Now I couldn't make a Bisquick video without making an impossible pie. And I'm going with this impossible vegetable pie. And that is what it looks like. Heat oven to 400, that's, that's what's happening now. Lightly grease a pie plate, done. This recipe starts with either two cups of fresh broccoli or 10 ounces of frozen broccoli. I opted for frozen broccoli that has been thawed and drained because I had some in my freezer to use up. And I'm gonna go ahead and add that to my pie plate. If you use fresh broccoli, you will need to cook it beforehand. If you use frozen chopped broccoli, you're just gonna need to thaw and drain it. I have half a cup of chopped onion and also half a cup of chopped green pepper. It says broccoli or cauliflower, or you could probably do a mix of two. I'm just going with the broccoli because I already had some. I'm gonna mix that together a bit. You can hear the birds singing outside because I have the windows open. And I also have four ounces of shredded cheese. This is like a white cheddar that I had. It says just cheddar cheese and I needed to use this up. So, you know, <laughs> throw a bunch of things in a pie plate, <laughs> make it on up. What a great way to use up some stuff in your fridge. All right, we're all mixed. I'm gonna set that aside. The way. Okay, bring it in the hand mixer. Beat remaining ingredients until smooth. So those remaining ingredients are a cup and a half of milk, three quarters of a cup of Bisquick baking mix, the star of the show. I have three eggs here. And a teaspoon of salt and a quarter teaspoon of pepper. Beat until smooth 15 seconds in a blender on high speed or one minute with a hand beater. So I am gonna use my hand mixer. Didn't wanna dig out the blender. Coming back in with the veggies and cheese. Pour into the pie plates. I'm gonna pour this over that. So there it is. And now I have to bake this for 35 to 40 minutes. I cut myself a little slice here so you can see the cross section. This took quite a bit longer <laughs> to bake than it said in the recipe. So I think it said 35 to 40 minutes at 400 degrees. I think I ended up baking this for a total of about 55 minutes. And I do seem to remember in the past when I have made impossible pies, it seems like the bake time is maybe a little bit low in the recipe, at least for me. Your oven may vary a little bit. I did check the temperature, the internal temperature of mine. It was fine. So just, you know, keep an eye on it. Allow yourself a little extra time if you need to. This smells so good. This smells so, so good. <laughs> Baking in the oven and I'm very hungry. This is my lunch today. So I kind of can't wait to give this a try. I'm just gonna do it. Mm -hmm. Really good flavor. Really good flavor, especially if you like broccoli. One change I would make right off the bat. I think I would saute the onions and peppers. They are a little crunchy for my tastes. Um, the broccoli was frozen and thawed, so it was already kind of soft. And even if I hadn't used frozen broccoli, you were supposed to cook it if you use fresh broccoli. I don't know why it didn't say anything about cooking the onions and peppers. You know, I think they add a lot of nice flavor, but I think that it would be even better if you just cook those veggies and soften them a bit. I also think you could customize the vegetables in this. A few videos back, I talked about using up a vegetable tray in a soup. I think that was my leftover ham recipes for Easter. If you haven't watched it yet, I'll link it in the description down below. Uh, but this would be a great way, like another great way to do that. Vary up your vegetables, chop them really fine. Maybe cook them, make sure they're kind of soft. Make them into an impossible pie. I am just gonna go ahead and enjoy this. It is very tasty. And I think 
what I'm gonna do with the rest of this, I think I'm gonna use this as like a breakfast prep. I think this would make an excellent breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Next, I'm trying out these glazed lemon squares. Heat oven to 350, so that is what I am doing. It says mix one cup of baking mix. So here is my one cup of Bisquick with powdered sugar. So I have two tablespoons of powdered sugar. And I'm just gonna, whoops, whisk that with my twist whisk a little bit. Get that combined. Cut in the butter. So I have two tablespoons of cold butter that I've cut into little cubes and it is stuck together. If you haven't guessed, we're making the crust first. So this is almost like, you know, sort of a pastry kind of crust. So I'm just gonna work on cutting this together and I'll be right back. Okay, so you'll see this is kind of like crumbly sand. That's, that's kind of what you're going for. And now I need to press this into an eight by eight pan, ungreased. Okay, that, that worked out well, I think. So there's my crust. And now I have to bake this at 350 degrees for about 10 minutes. Okay, right, while the crust is in the oven, I'm gonna go ahead and work on the filling. And basically it just says, mix remaining ingredients. Three fourths of a cup of granulated sugar. I have two eggs here. I have one tablespoon of Bisquick. Get out of there. <laughs> it says one quarter cup of flaked coconut if desired. I'm not gonna put the coconut in this time. I'm just trying this for the first time. I want it to be just, you know, basic lemon squares. And I need to add a teaspoon of zest and I'm gonna use my tiny zester for that. I, I actually used this a few weeks ago in my breakfast ideas video. And if you missed that one, here's what this great little zester does. So you just grate, you know, grate your lemon. The zest just goes into this little shallow spot here. It's wonderful. It makes it so much easier to deal with. We're gonna shift around a bit because I'm gonna cut this in half so I can juice it with my tiny juicer, of course. And I just need two tablespoons. Yes. So half of a lemon for me, that particular lemon was about two tablespoons of juice. I think I'm gonna try to just beat this by hand. I don't feel like taking out the hand mixer again. So let's just see. I think I can do it. It's not like a ton of ingredients, you know? Hmm, yeah, that wasn't too bad. So once my crust is cooled, I'll pour this over the top. My crust has cooled somewhat. I'm just gonna re-whisk that a little bit. And now I just need to pour this over the crust. So now I get to bake this for 25 minutes. These just came out of the oven. And before I make the glaze and pour it over the top, I'm supposed to loosen the edges while it's still warm. Whoops, I just pulled a whole bunch of that off the top. Eh, it's sticking, it's sticking. I mean, we know these aren't gonna be perfect. <laughs> so set that aside and now I have to make the glaze. And all it is is half a cup of powdered sugar and one tablespoon of lemon juice. I'm gonna whisk that together until it's smooth. So now I'm gonna spread this bit of glaze over the top. These are some teeny tiny little lemon squares. I'm supposed to get 64 squares, 64 one inch squares out of this pan. Yeah, I, I don't think that's happening. I <laughs> I can almost never cut them as small as the recipes in these books say. So mine might be a little larger. Getting a little enthusiastic. <laughs> kind of breaking up the top a bit. Okay. And now I just need to let these cool completely before I can cut them and give them a taste. Okay, let me bring one of these over so you can see it. These are like kind of sticky and messy because, you know, lemon bars. Is that focus? Yeah. You can see it actually has some like distinct layers to it, more so than I thought it would. Um, yeah, so all that's left is to give it a taste. Mmm, <laughs> that's a pretty dang good lemon bar. I think the crust in proportion to filling, they're almost equal, like half crust, half filling. So it really kind of depends on how you feel about that. Some people really like crust when it comes to like pies and bars and things. I could not cut these as small as they said too in the book, you're supposed to get 64 one inch squares from that eight inch pan. No, no, not happening for me. 
uh, I would have destroyed all of them. <laughs> because honestly, like truth be told, they weren't like the easiest to cut either. You know, I tried to cut some to make them look nice for the thumbnail because I kind of have to do that. But yeah, they, they weren't super, super simple to cut. Uh, maybe next time I would possibly try parchment paper in the bottom and make like a sling. I like to do that sometimes. I'm not sure if it would work here or not, but mm, these are good. Like even better than I thought they would be. A pastry shortbread kind of crust with an actual, like, I don't know. I expected the filling to maybe be a little bit different than this, but it is pretty close to just a regular like lemon bar recipe, if you know what I mean. Like usually it's like a lemon curd, um, this is maybe a little bit softer than that, but it's pretty close and it tastes really good and it like didn't take a lot of effort or ingredients. <laughs> so that's a good thing in my book. For this next segment, I'm bringing back a classic video of mine for chili quiche squares. I made these squares back in June of 2022 from this very same cookbook. I've made them a couple of times since with my own updates to the seasoning, to the flavor, and you'll hear me talk about that in the taste test. Heat oven to 375, done. Grease a square pan, also done. Can we just call some attention to this beautiful new pan I have that is not Pyrex? This dish is produced by Made In. They have all kinds of really beautiful kitchen items. This is not sponsored by the way. This was actually an anniversary gift from my husband. It's almost like modern day Pyrex. I need to open this. Yeah. So I have a four ounce can of chopped green chilies here that I have to drain. We start by sprinkling these chilies in the pan. Try to evenly distribute them. This recipe reminds me a lot of like a chili relleno casserole. It's supposed to be an appetizer where you cut it into very small squares, but I think you could probably serve this as a main dish if you cut those squares just a little bit bigger. Got our chilies. Next comes the cheese. So I have two cups of grated cheddar cheese. It said you could use cheddar cheese or Monterey Jack cheese. Sprinkle that on top of the chilies. This is gonna be nice and cheesy. I approve of this amount of cheese. Got our cheese. Set that aside as we move on to mix up the rest of our ingredients. One cup of Bisquick, one cup of half and half. I have four large eggs. <laughs> Someone's gonna yell at me for cracking eggs against my Pyrex, so I'm gonna try not to do that. <laughs> Lastly, it says one eighth of a teaspoon of hot pepper sauce. I'm not gonna bother to measure that. I think that is kind of to taste. So we'll just put a few dashes in. Pour this mixture into that pan. I'm interested to see how this works out, if this is gonna be like a Bisquick Impossible quiche. And I'm not gonna tip this, but everything's in here. I'm gonna bake this for 30 minutes at 375 degrees. This took exactly 30 minutes to bake. You can tell it's done when you insert a knife into the middle and it comes out clean. I let this cool for 10 minutes as directed in the recipe. It came out very cleanly as well. You can see that I cut a little piece, but I have not tried it yet. And I'm very, very excited to give this a taste. That is pretty good. That is pretty good, but you know what's coming. It needs more seasoning. <laughs> this really could use like, maybe just like a little pinch of salt. You know, if you were gonna serve this as an appetizer, you could maybe include a selection of hot sauces. I think that would be a lot of fun, just so people can dress it up a little bit on their own. But really good recipe. Betty Crocker's Creative Recipes with Bisquick was published in 1980. And it was published to commemorate Bisquick's 50th anniversary. So yes, Bisquick, was introduced by General Mills in like 1930, 1931. I've seen both dates, there's conflicts, whatever. Take whatever you want. Just a little bit of history on Bisquick. As the story goes, a salesman that worked at General Mills was taking a train to San Francisco and the dining car was closed. So, you know, he was very hungry and he asked the chef on the train to just make him something quick, but that, you know, wasn't too much trouble. And minutes later, the chef brought him a plate of hot biscuits and he was, just amazed, you know, how did you produce these biscuits so quickly? These are delicious. The chef revealed that he had a pre-made mix of flour, lard, baking powder, and salt that he kept in an ice chest and he could make the biscuits very, very quickly. And, you know, this general mill salesperson, those wheels got turning and he worked with a food scientist to develop this shelf stable version of the product that became Bisquick. So one thing I do need to mention, the formula of Bisquick has changed over the years. So if you're gonna cook a recipe from the past with Bisquick, you're definitely gonna wanna test it out, see how it turns out. 
Uh, the other thing I might recommend doing is searching to see if they have an updated version of that recipe. Just wanted to put that out there because it, you know, there was like Bisquick and then there was new Bisquick and then they have changed it multiple times since. Your mileage may vary with Bisquick <laughs> if you're cooking a recipe from the past. Let's take a little gander at this book. There's a good look at the cover. It's got, you know, showcases a few of the items you can make with Bisquick where the recipes are in here and then this is what a Bisquick box looked like in 1980. On the first few pages, they have all of these, whoops, photographs of like different things, Bisquick packaging, like the original Bisquick packaging here. They have the first Bisquick cookbook, which I have. <laughs> here is the very first cookbook that was like based around Bisquick. It's Betty Crocker's 101 Delicious Bisquick Creations. And this book came out in, I believe, 1933. There are just so many beautiful photographs in this. I'm not gonna show too much because, you know, this is not the cookbook that I have featured in this video, but maybe I'll feature it in a future video. There's also another photo in here of another cookbook, So Quick with New Bisquick. I have that one too. I've actually cooked from that one on this channel. I believe, what did I make? I think it was like the baked meat sandwiches and those turned out to be so delicious, so good. I'll link that in the description down below if you have not tried it. We'll talk about those cookbooks another time because we're talking about this one. <laughs> 1980, this cookbook really does kind of make me think of that time period. Something about the way the photographs are, I think I've said this, in other videos um, about cookbooks from this era. We've got a chapter of Bisquick basics. So that's going to be how to use your Bisquick to make like the basic things that would be like on the Bisquick box. So we've got rolled biscuits, pancakes, waffles, drop biscuits, dumplings. Um, there should be a shortcake recipe in here, coffee cake, muffins, all kinds of things. There's also, you know, I think that has kind of changed up over the years as well. The basic things, basic recipes you can use Bisquick for. There was usually something called velvet crumb cake. And I'm, I'm wondering if that got like folded into the coffee cake recipe kind of. The second chapter we have appetizers and snacks. Very like early eighties photograph and like this lettering style too. I don't know if that's, sorry about the glare. I think that looks pretty 80s. It's got that like curly, curvy kind of kind of lettering, you know, early 80s. I'm talking early 80s here, folks. But we do have a lot of really delicious looking photographs, I will say. Not all of you are going to agree with me. <laughs> I think this looks very good, but it is called Creamy Tuna Garden Wedges. I know not everybody really likes tuna that watches my channel, as you have let me know multiple times. Fried cheese melt away? Heck yes. So I think what these are is you make the Bisquick dough, you wrap it around chunks of cheese, and then you fry them. Holy cow. Kind of sounds amazing. Main dishes and side dishes. So you're going to get your savory impossible pies in here. And I realized like thinking back on my, my impossible pie footage. I don't think I really explained what that is. And I think many of you are familiar, but in case you're not, an impossible pie made with Bisquick is a pie that like makes its own crust, basically. There are savory ones like I made, there are sweet ones like a pumpkin pie, a coconut pie, there's several. I have an entire cookbook that is full of Bisquick impossible pies. It was published, I think in the early 2000s. You saw me put the vegetables and different things in the pie dish. And then I mixed up the eggs and the Bisquick and the liquid and everything and poured it over. And I think when my impossible pie came out of the oven, it wasn't exactly evident. Like you couldn't see the layers very well. It was kind of fluffy and piping hot, but I've since been eating those pieces of impossible pie for breakfast. And you can see like a distinct like crust layer on the bottom. So basically, you know, that Bisquick kind of like makes the crust on the bottom. And that's why it's called impossible <laughs> because you don't have to make a separate pie crust for it. Here's one for smoked beef casserole. Whoops. So this is more of a fluffy layer on the bottom and then you put everything else on top. That sounds good. Ooh, Reuben turnovers? Heck yes, I am here for that. I feel like I've talked about Reuben turnovers another time. Oh no, I made Reuben balls, that's what it was. I made air fryer Reuben balls, those were really good. I should make those again soon. Oven fried chicken, I have not tried this for myself, but I do know that some people like to use Bisquick as like a batter mix or like a breading kind of mix. So we've got our breads and our coffee cakes. 
here. Ooh, cheese and onion wedges, that looks delectable. Looks like it would accompany something like a nice hearty soup or a chili. I could imagine that. I think it would be so good. Lots and lots of like muffins and scones. In fact, there's a recipe for orange juice muffins in here. Looks very similar to the orange blossom muffins I made for my Easter brunch video. Very similar. Oh, and they have like a cherry version as well. That sounds pretty good. And then they have some different um, variations on pancakes and waffles. I know growing up, like we did use Bisquick to make pancakes. I do remember that. And then Bisquick also came out with a product and I think it's still available now called Shake and Pour. And that was what we took camping actually uh, because it's in a bottle, like kind of like a pourable bottle with a lid and you just add your liquid, shake it up and then you can pour the pancakes right on your griddle. So it just makes for like perfect camping food because it's kind of self-contained. I think you only had to add water to it if I'm not mistaken. I haven't had that in years. These look so good. These caramel rolls, I want to make them. A nice glaze with those pecans on top. How good does that look? I think I maybe even said that in my chili quiche squares video that I originally made with this book. Oh, and I, I still haven't made them. So let's change that, shall we? We come to the cakes and cookies chapter and there's a nice like bunt cake there. There's a carrot cake recipe that looks pretty good. Cookies, there's some different cookies you can make. So I actually made a peanut butter cookie recipe over on my Patreon that was like Bisquick, but it also had sweetened condensed milk in it. And those were pretty good. It was, I made them into peanut blossoms because of course I did. I love a peanut blossom. You'll know that if you watched my last video on the Pillsbury Bake Off. There's also, I spotted these on the cover too, these double frosted brownies. Don't these look like the brownie confections in uh, Betty Crocker's new good and easy cookbook that I, I kind of talked about them. I didn't make them in that video. I actually, again, I made those for my patrons. So, I mean, I do try to make extra videos over on Patreon. If you want to support me over there, you know, you can. No, no pressure though. I just letting you know. <laughs> and then we finally have desserts and pies. I don't know what this is. It looks so good though, with all of that beautiful fruit and the glaze on top. It makes it nice and shiny. Oh, those are French tart. Nope. <laughs> French fruit tart wedges. Don't want to get that mixed up. <laughs> yeah, there's there's an impossible pumpkin pie in here. Um, the first impossible pie was introduced in the late 70s. Again, I saw some conflicting years on this between 1976 and 1978. Some people are saying that the impossible pumpkin pie was the first one. Other people are saying that the impossible coconut pie was the first one. So again, I don't know what the truth is, <laughs> but there you are. It, these pies have been around since the 70s, okay? So let's talk about the recipes I cooked today. So the first recipe that I tried out was the impossible vegetable pie. Super, super tasty, would make a great, like any kind of meal. I said breakfast, lunch, or dinner. I had it for lunch the day that I made it. It was delicious, like fresh out of the oven, but also I've been sort of like eating the rest of it throughout the last several days for breakfast. That stuff reheats so well. It is such a delight in the morning to have that ready to go. I just pop it in the microwave for about 90 seconds. Um, I do, when I'm like heating it back up, I do like to cut the wedges into like smaller wedges just so that it like heats evenly. Great way to get your veggies in as well. I think you could, you know, change up the vegetables depending on what you have. I would say if you're gonna do that, if you're not gonna follow exactly whatever vegetables are in here, make sure that it's not anything that's like too full of water. Like, you know, you might wanna watch out for tomatoes and stuff. Anything that contains a lot of water that it's gonna express, I guess you could say, you might just kinda of wanna be careful with that. Or, you know, if you're gonna do say zucchini, I would probably saute that zucchini just, you know, for a little extra flavor, a little extra color into kind of like get some of the water out before you put it in the pie. Cause I think that's, that would affect the bake times and the moisture levels. It might kind of like disturb things in that department, but the vegetables that it says in the recipe were really good. I happened to have some frozen broccoli I wanted to use up. I think I said the one change I would probably make, I would saute the green pepper and the onion. That was something I noticed when I ate the pie right away. Like the day that I made it, it was still kind of crunchy. After reheating it for a few days for breakfast, like the crunchiness kind of like goes away. So, you know, take that however you want. Maybe you like your vegetables crunchier than I do, but I think sauteing them couldn't hurt, right? I think you could definitely switch up the cheese in this depending on what you have. I think it would be 
a pretty fantastic way to use up some leftover vegetables and just different cheeses and stuff that you have as well. This one is definitely a keeper and I will be making it again. <laughs> So for the second recipe, I made some glazed lemon squares and I don't know if I showed the photo of what they're supposed to look like. That's what they're supposed to look like right there. Very cute, very petite in the book. These tasted very good and I was surprised by how good they tasted just because the filling itself was like not super time consuming or anything like that. Sometimes I've seen recipes where you have to like cook up a lemon curd kind of like separately and then spread it on top of a crust. But this was very, very easy. I mentioned they were hard to get out of the pan. I mean, and seriously, seriously difficult to get out of the pan. If I was like just going to serve them to someone, I probably, that would impact my decision to make these. But because it was just me, like, you know, I had some not so attractive looking bars <laughs> for the most part. So the things that I think kind of contributed to that, you've got a very thin, very like, mm, cookie like crumbly crust, which is delicious, tastes so good. And then you have a very thin layer of your lemon filling. And I think that kind of makes them a little bit delicate because they were kind of like breaking apart and different things. I almost wonder, just because of the, like the filling layer is very thin, I think like the thinness of that layer contributes. Like it makes it hard to get them out in one piece. I almost wonder, I don't know if this would work, if you could possibly like double the filling, that might just complicate things further, but Maybe something I'll try in the future because they did taste good. Like honestly, like super good, super easy lemon squares. Cutting them and presenting them would maybe be a problem, I guess. And I definitely, you know, they look so cute here. These are supposed to be like one inch squares. I definitely could not cut them that small. Mine were bigger because if I cut them smaller, I think that they, I probably would have like destroyed all of them. <laughs> Lastly, I brought back a video that I did a couple of years ago, almost a couple of years ago now, for chili quiche squares, or they're actually called chili quiche appetizers in this book. Pretty much like very close to one of those impossible pies, only you cut them, you make them in a square pan and you cut them into squares and people can eat them that way. I thought this recipe was delicious as is, but I did mention it, it could use a little bit more seasoning for me anyway. Maybe a little bit of seasoned salt or garlic salt, I probably would have some sort of like cayenne in there. I'd offer it up with hot sauces. You know, I have made this recipe once or twice, probably twice since then. And I did make those changes and it, it did make it a little bit of a better experience, even better, even better than the original, even though the original was tasty. I would make this for brunch. I feel like this would be a super fun little dish to make for brunch and like serve as the main part of it even. I know it's supposed to be an appetizer and you could make them into little squares, um, but I, I think you could go either way with it. What, what all was in there? So cheese, of course, and some jarred, just like chilies or canned chilies. Um, and then all of your Bisquick making stuff. And actually like I always have chilies in the pantry, um, just cause I use them for other recipes. So I pretty much always have all of this stuff on hand. You know, if you're having some people over and it's kind of like more of a last minute thing, this would be something really easy. To, to put together and probably kind of impressive. I think people would really enjoy the taste and you could vary the spice level, of course, depending on the kind of chilies you use and the spices that you wanna add. I remember this one reheating very well too. So it's very similar to that impossible pie. It's another thing you could kind of do as a breakfast prep if you wanted a little bit more spice in your mornings. <laughs> if you love Betty Crocker cookbooks and recipes, I have an entire playlist and I'll link it in the description down below. I also have additional content on Patreon, so if you'd like to check that out, I will leave a link in the description so that you can do that. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it gave you some new ideas or maybe brought back memories of a recipe you haven't made in a while. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.